So tone. I've got a few notes here about tone. Everyone gets very concerned about tone. Uh, and tone is just basically, you know, how good does the, I guess you could say, how good does the individual note sound when it's coming out of your fiddle? And uh, so I'll just talk about a few things briefly. Uh, I'm not a luthier by any chance, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but uh, one thing I've found, and actually in recent years, is that uh, for one thing, uh, you know, it's like golf. I, fiddling is like a hobby, you know, it, it, it's a hobby for us too. We never made our living playing music. And, you know, any golfer will tell you the better set of golf clubs will get you in the hole more often. So with fiddle, you know, get, get the fiddle that you can afford, but it's, it's good, you know. Don't go nuts and buy one that's way, uh, way massively expensive unless you, know, uh, have inherited money recently or something like that, then go for it. But, but get, get a fiddle that you can afford that's good. And if you don't know what's good, get, take somebody with you who plays well and have them help you pick one out. But I've been finding re in recent, uh, actually even in recent months, uh, having my uh, luthier guy play with my sound post position make, can make a huge, massive difference. Mine got out of place last year. We were up in, we go to this festival called Pembroke uh, in Ontario, and I was playing outside all week, and like it was massively, it was cold and rainy. And like you could see rain hanging in the air. When I got home, I had buzzing, and I took it to the guy at, who works on my fiddle, and he said, "Well, the only thing holding the top on is the bridge. Like it was almost he just you know a few little clicks and it popped off. So, so my sound post got moved. Long long story short, and uh, so then we he had to reposition it, and and it took me several times going back to get it to where I thought it sounded the way it did before. So your sound post position." can make a lot of difference in your fiddle. Uh, let's see, where, you know, here's my imbibement here. And then uh, then strings, you know, I, I use, uh, people ask me what kind of strings I use. I use one thing uh, with the heavy Scottish origin of not, I like, like cheap strings, uh, but I don't go too cheap. Um, uh, these are Prims, steel Prims. Uh, they're the green label, I think they're they are, but they're orchestra medium, I believe is what they call them. But uh, uh, they're all steel. Now, some people like uh, synthetic core strings, you know, but they're much more expensive. And uh, I play a lot in the summer outside in humid Midwestern weather, and those other kinds of strings don't stay in tune. Of course, people will tell you, well, the reason what's going on is the, that the strings are moving your fiddle around rather than the fiddle moving the strings around, but you just have to kind of live with that. But, but they stay in tune, and they're not particularly bright, but they're kind of dark sounding. So these are prims. There's a, uh, another string that is very similar called Yargar, J-A-R-G-A-R, -A -A I think. That Bobby Taylor, actually, if you've heard of Bobby Taylor, he used those for years. I'm not sure what Bobby's using now. A lot of people like helicore strings, which is also a steel string, but it's wound a little differently. So to me, those are a little too flexible. They're kind of a little softer feel under the finger. Um, and then another thing that uh, we don't often think about making a great difference in tone is rosin. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you get really cheap rosin, you know, it's going to not sound as good as better rosin. And so for most of my fiddling life, I've used Hill Dark Rosin, which costs, you know, I buy it on Amazon, it costs about $11 or so. You know, and you hate to lose it because it costs $11. But there's $3 rosin too, you know, and $3 rosin is not going to sound as good as $11 rosin. Uh, and uh, the old timers, when I was growing up, actually would switch rosins. The blonde amber rosin was for the warm months and the dark crossing was for the winter months. I don't think there was any th anything to that necessarily, but uh, maybe they thought the, <laughs> you know, rosin does get gummy, especially again, if you're in the Midwest and it's really massively humid, you know, the rosin can't, you can't get gummy. And, and another thing to remember is that you, and I have a big center, is to keep your fiddle clean. Uh, there was an old guy who used to work on my fiddle when I was first starting out, and he said, dirt don't have tone. That was his, you know, Alfred Rice was this old fiddle maker in Columbia, Missouri. That's where I grew up. And uh, yeah, he said, there's no tone in dirt. So you want to keep your fiddle clean. You want to clean the strings once in a while. Uh, and again, I'll uh, uh, disclaimer on everything because I'm not a luthier, but you can take a, a rag and stick it under here. So, because you don't want to get alcohol on your varnish, you know. But if you take a light 
bit of alcohol on a cotton swab. Sometimes it helps to just wipe the cruddy rosin off your... Usually I do it like this, <laughs> yeah, which seems to work fairly well, but uh, once in a while it can get really caked on there. And the reason you get caked on there for me is I don't like to change my strings. A lot of people are real big into changing strings all the time, and I just change them when they break, you know. Or if they start to look really ugly or ratty on one end, then I might put a new set on. But I hate new fiddle strings. They just, to me, they don't sound good. They just need to be broke in for a while to, to sound good. So uh, uh, if you got your fiddles, let's play a little fun warm-up tune. What do you say? Get your fiddles out. I, and I only play in standard tuning generally, so we'll play it up in D probably. How about Mississippi Sawyer? Does everybody know that? Yeah. Yes. Now, what do you use for your E string? You still it's a solid steel E, yeah. Solid steel. And, and the E string, I have I found there's not much difference in the solid steel E's. I can take one from almost any set of strings and use. So this is the this is the prim E, but if I had an E from some other set, as long as it was just a solid E. There's wound E strings, you know, but I, I think my finger's a little too acidic. Those wound E strings, sometimes I just immediately, the covering starts to fray off. And, but let's play a little Mississippi Sawyer. Of course, the guy who makes the coleslaw in Mississippi is a Mississippi Slawyer. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Please don't laugh. Don't anymore. Be more. We're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. <laughs> But I like this tune. This would go, sometime I'm going to make, you know how all these top ten lists, clickbait lists are on, on YouTube, on the internet, you know. Sometimes I'm going to put up a clickbait site with ads all over it. The ten best hoedowns, you know, and you have to keep clicking to get to the... <laughs> and there'll be ads for reverse, reverse mortgages and, and Viagra and stuff on there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Not that those two would go together and the, the needs of the people <laughs> reverse. Oh, that's a nice camper. That's, nice. that's, oh, that's nice. sweet. Yeah. Good yeah. That would, if their windows yeah. were down, we could give them a round of applause. <laughs> that's a really nice camper, man. But this is one of my favorite tunes, and I consider it one of the... This would be in my top ten list of the greatest hoedowns of all time. I'm a dance caller. This is one of my favorite tunes to call to. Really? For square dances? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. The chestnuts. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, There's it, a reason. It's an it's a old-time chestnut. Oh, here's my little thingy. You know, there are books uh, about exercises to do for playing the violin. I think uh, there's a woman who, Julie Lieberman, or who wrote a book about... Uh, you know, things to do to loosen up and all. I use the 12 ounce curl. <laughs> Seems to work very good. I never get any tendonitis or anything. <laughs> Give you a second. No pressure. <laughs> Let's try a little Mississippi story here. About right here, here we go.
Oh yeah, sounds great. That's that's a good one there. A nice little roll. That sounded good, everybody. So uh, uh, another big thing about tone is uh, is balancing bow speed and bow pressure, depending on you know what you're trying to do sound wise. And so there's uh, with the bow pressure and speed, you know, there's everything from this kind of the flute thing. You know, which is really fast and really light, you know? And then there's this, which is really slow and really heavy. So, just get in between there somewhere. <laughs> it's real technical. I know, it's highly technical. I've analyzed my playing extensively to figure that out. <laughs> but actually, uh, there is a technique, and I heard Johnny Gimple do talk about this one time. Everybody know who he is, the great Western swing fiddler. He played in many bands. He played in, in little ensembles of violins, of fiddles in, in, in the band. There would be three fiddles playing triple harmony and stuff. But he said they had a, and I'd never heard of this before, and now I actually find there's a, an actual, uh, you know, Latinate or Italian term for this, flautato or something like that, where you make the violin sound like a flute. And you do that by, by going, moving the bow fast, but with very light pressure. So you get this, let's see what I can do. And it gets this kind of breathy, flutey kind of sound. It's Which so you probably use that if you had a mic. Uh, I don't know. It's, I don't it depends. Know. You could hear the difference, couldn't you? It kind of has this breathy, airy sort of sound. But uh, yeah. but uh, at any event, you know. So that's like one end of the extreme, and then and then. But so when I'm playing, uh, I tend to. Uh, uh, just try to find the sweet spot, you know, like so if I if I'm play let's just, I'll just play a D scale here for you, so like And I'll try not to do any vibrato to it. That's the three stooges in there, but but so you know I'm just trying to find a place where I'm getting enough movement of the of this of the of the bow in terms of speed and enough pressure that it doesn't go, you know. But I still get a nice big full tone, and it's going to be different on every instrument. But it's something worth practicing, and you want to practice it slowly by playing big whole notes and pulling the bow long, and then you know you come to the point where well, how do I make a nice round, good sounding note on a on a batch of fast moving sixteenth uh, notes, you know? And that's a different kind of problem. Uh, I tend to play very much saw stroke. That's kind of the Midwestern way. I, in fact, when I teach tunes, if I teach tunes later this weekend even, I won't teach uh, much in the way of bowing patterns. And I know the Eastern traditions have a lot of bowing patterns. I see people like Brad Leftwich, who's very analyze, analytical with his playing. You know, he uses very particular patterns. And my bowing is much more ad hoc, I think. But so I always tell people saw this saw until you can't play at speed, and then a slur will reveal itself, and it sort of does, you know, because you'll need to, you'll have to slur to keep speed up unless you're really good with just going back and forth like a mandolin pick. Uh, but so how do you? One of the things that happens when people play fast running sixteenth notes is they start to sound mushy. And so a, bow, a fiddle bow is like a pendulum, you know. When a pendulum swings back and forth. At the top of each swing, there's a point where there's no motion. And so when you move your bow back and forth, there's a point there where there's no motion. Well, the trick is to move your finger at the place where there's no motion. Because if you're fiddling sounding mushy, it means you're not synchronizing your fingers with the bow. So, you know. And again, that just takes a lot of practice. You know, for me, I've been playing so long, it's really automatic, but if but it's not automatic when you first start by any stretch of the imagination. So you want to play, do that slowly, and actually, you know, physically stop the bow and move your fingers if you need to, till you get a nice separated kind of noting. Because uh, in, in any style of music, there's always going to be passages where there's it's got to be noty and not, you know, connected. And so you want to be able to play those, those kind of separated passages. Let's see what else I have. What other, what other nonsense I had written here? Okay, yeah. So uh, another thing that affects tone quite a lot, actually, and 
this is now kind of the next level of tone production is actually how hard you press with your fingers affects the tone of your play. And usually when I'm playing reels and things like that, uh, I press down pretty hard. You know, noty, noty hoedowns and things, I'm pressing down pretty hard. But sometimes when I get to playing waltzes and things that have more express expression to them, uh, <clears throat> I'll play not so hard. I won't press down quite so hard. And especially if you're trying to play double stops, you want to press down not so hard because you don't want your hand locked in position because you can't make you know minor intonation adjustments to keep things in tune. So, but actually does affect. Uh, why don't we just everybody listening under their ear? Let's just play. Uh, uh, can everyone play? If I just say play a D scale, can everybody play a D scale? Okay, so we're gonna play from D to this D. Okay, and so and I, I'll just count da 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 like that. And let's just play under our own ear. Let's just listen. Do play around with the how hard you're pressing down, and just see if you don't get some different kinds of tone. Here we go. Open D. Here we go. Just listen to yourself. Press down hard, now not so hard. Come on back down. Try it one more time. So did you hear any difference that you're pressing down? It, it really does make a difference, especially on held notes, like again, like in waltzes. We play lots of waltzes, and it makes a huge difference how hard you press down. You can color the note a little bit, and that sort of thing. Uh, so the last thing I had under uh, tone was vibrato. And uh, uh, for starters, if you had a, I've taught a lot of people who had a classical background. I don't have, have that, but uh, uh, it's hard. The first thing you want to be able to do is play without vibrato. Because, you know, if you get used to doing it all the time, you start to do it instinctively and you can't play without. So I always tell people, play it. I just call it play it flat, you know, just don't use any vibrato. And that's what we were trying to do with this uh, little scale we played. But uh, doing vibrato, does everyone have kind of a vibrato they do? Yeah, it's, 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 it doesn't have to be, it's a fit, I call, I'm calling it fiddler vibrato, you know, it's not classical vibrato. Uh, and I just kind of do like a finger vibrato, you know. If you haven't tried that, just go to the F sharp on the D string, this note, and just, and you're just kind of wiggling your finger, you know. A little bit going on with my wrist there. But so, so uh, you know, uh, I think I generally say for playing fiddle, the vibrato should be kind of long and slow. You know, usually violinist vibrato, especially on fast stuff, it's really fast, like a B, you know, they're getting a really quick, quick vibrato. But for fiddle music, and I've listened to a lot of fiddlers like Kenny Baker and uh, uh, especially bluegrass fiddlers playing and Texas style fiddlers who play waltzes and get really lush vibrato, it's a slow vibrato. And it's pretty wide too. We used to have a guy at home, uh, his name was Jimmy Gilmore, he lived in Jefferson City. And we used to say of him, he had a vibrato so wide you could drive a truck through it. But it was really ee when he'd play a waltz, it almost make you seasick to listen to him play. So you don't want to play quite that big a vibrato. but. To get a little vibrato sweetens up the note. It helps with intonation. Again, if you're holding a note, to have a little vibrato there helps with intonation. It gives the illusion that you're playing in tune when you're not, you know. <laughs> so, so that's all I had on tone. Does anybody have any questions? By the way, feel free to comment, question any way along. You don't have to wait to the end. Yes? So you don't have a classical background. How did you learn to do Oh, okay, well, just by kind of watching other people who I like and listening a lot, you know, like especially on these waltzes, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, play a festival waltz just in a little bit here. 
you know, listen to those Kenny Baker records till I like, and that was back in the day when you went uh, with the with the tone arm, you know. <laughs> Let's play a little bit of that. I'll I'll just play like halfway through just to show you a little. But it's a nice long slow vibrato. That's what I like. <laughs> on that note then. Really, it's pretty slow vibrato, you know. So you just have to kind of, you know, figure out what you're going to do here. And I kind of, I do tend to play with my hand turned, you know, pretty much straight with the neck like that when I'm doing those especially. Just hit that F sharp again. Let's just try to wiggle around on that F sharp. Now, one thing to do, I'll say, when you're practicing and when you're first starting out doing this, a good thing to do is because you want your hand to not be clenched on this on the fingerboard. And so, if you just do this first, go. Just literally slide your finger, and then pretty soon you, you tighten it up. So it's like. Try that on that F sharp there. It's gonna sound like a bunch of bees. <laughs> and I, I, it really helps to use a shoulder pad though too because uh, if you're gonna play those kind of things and especially the waltzes with the double stops where you need good ability to adjust where your hand is at you know instantaneously you want to not be supporting so much of the violin with this hand. I kind of say, you know, 70-30. I want to be holding it up 70% with my neck and shoulder and 30% with my hand. And I, when I first learned, started out playing, I didn't use a shoulder pad for, you know, 15 years. And I'd clench the fiddle really hard like this, you know. And I, it, you can't play that stuff, you know, that those kind of tunes and that kind of technique if you're clenching the, the neck. So you got to really, you got to loosen up, you know, loosen up. So any, any uh, yeah. I have a question. So once you figure out that vibrato, yeah. is it? Would you say that the finger is just sort of rocking? Is it literally sliding? No, it's not sliding. It's okay, it's, it's rocking. rocking. Yeah, I just said yeah. the slide thing. I think yeah. sliding helps you loosen your hand up on okay. the neck, yeah, but yeah. but ultimately, right? You're not really sliding. You're. Am I sliding? A little bit, maybe. <laughs> Anyway, that gives you an idea, you know, something to try there. So I'm going to move on to uh, timing, okay? I've, that's tone. I have a few notes here on timing. So most about timing, I think of what's the right tempo to play the tunes. And there's a lot of, uh, you could get into a lot of arguments about the, what right tempo to play tunes. Uh, Pat and I play for a lot of dances. We play for lots of contra dances just because that's the dance you can play for nowadays. A lot of the old community square dances are gone. But when I was growing up and would go down in the Ozarks, and there was a guy named Bob Holt and several other guys down there who played with great vigor, you could say the least, uh, uh, they would play a square dance at 140 beats a minute, which is just ridiculously fast. Let's see if we can play something approximating that. Uh, okay. And uh, so let's see, we'll play Holt County Breakdown just at one time. Let's see. In A. 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 So that's pretty darn fast, you know, but, and that probably wasn't fast enough, you know. It probably wasn't quite enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, but there's a really cool technological innovation 
that someone pointed out to me the other day. It's in, uh, and you know, I hate buying things just as a rule, but there's something called Live BPM. Have you heard of this app? It's on, I think, I don't know, if, I know it's on Android. I don't have a uh, Apple, but but it's a thing, uh, an app that you have to pay for it. And it went, Ugh. Oh, four whole dollars. It's four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> And, but but it really works great. I have a little stand. Uh, we've been using it just for the past few months, just for grins, you know. But I got a little stand. I set it on, and my phone has a big display, and it it listens to you, and then says you're going at 110 beats a minute, or you're going at 115 beats a minute, which is kind of cool, you know. Uh, so so for most fiddle playing, if you get in the 116 to 120 range, I'd say that's a pretty good, nice, peppy tempo. Uh, that'll work for a lot of contra dances. It'll work for a New England square. It'll work for a lot of things. Just for listening and playing comfortably, it's not a hard tempo to play at. Uh, but then there are certain types of tunes that you have to back off a little bit. And Pat's a dance caller as well as being a piano player. But so if you uh, have a contra dance that has complex movements like a, a hay for, or some other uh, movement where they have to do a lot of turning. You might want to back off to 110 or 107 beats per minute, which it doesn't sound like much, but it's huge, the difference in the ability of the dancers to keep up with what you're doing. So uh, it's fun to play with that little tool, even to just set it on the table and play along or, or find a recording you think, oh, that's about the right tempo. Just kind of guess and see what tempo they're playing at. Uh, and I also find that, uh, and, and Bob Christensen told me this, Bob Christensen was a, uh, a hobbyist, but uh, more than that, he was he, he recorded and collected fiddlers all over the Midwest and wrote two very wonderful volumes of music. He's passed on, but if you see the old time fiddlers repertory, volumes one and two, and volume one particularly, uh, the, he I, I helped him with volume two with some tunes because he said in his words directly, he said, I shot my wad on the first volume. <laughs> so, I had, so I had to help him find some tunes to fill the second volume in. But, uh, but the first volume is particularly good, and there are all these Midwestern tunes, Missouri Valley, uh, Bob Walters, Dwight Lamb, Cyril Stinnett, those kind of players. But uh, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, the t proper tempos. So he was very uh, adamant about the proper tempo, and, and he's the one who taught me that the proper tempo for a waltz is pretty much the same tempo as for a hoedown. You wouldn't think, well, that sounds too fast. But if you're a waltzer, and you know, people think a waltz is a slow tune, but it's not really, you know. Two, three, one. That's probably about 120 beats a minute right there. It's pretty quick, you know. A waltz is more fun to dance if it's faster. You can't get around if you play too slow on a waltz. They can't make the turns. Yeah, so so you need speed when you're playing a waltz. Shall we try a waltz together? Does everyone know a peekaboo waltz? Does people play that? Let's try that. If you don't, it's it's easy to get on to. Let's play peekaboo. Peekaboo. What key's that? D. In? But I'll play it at my what I consider a good waltzable tempo. Tempo here. Here we go. So that's a fun waltz, and that's a good. That's the right tempo. You want people to go wee and get out there and really dance. Yeah. You know, you know. You're it's like, not. Can I just see him flying around the floor? It's not a funeral dirge. <laughs> you know, just uh, 
Uh, and, and, you know, again, the same could be said for things like shottishes and playing tunes in 6-8 time. I kind of just, you know, beat my foot. It's fewer notes per bar, of course, so it's, it we works out. We do have to control ourselves in a shottish. Yeah, sometimes you want to play too fast. And a humble is like, show me the dance. I've got to see it, because you can really <laughs> play too fast in a humble. It's not waltz tempo at all. It's a lot slower. It's a lot slower. So, uh, so that's uh, about all I was going to say about well, the timing. About what happens if you play too slow at Ava. Oh, well, yeah, this, uh, the, 140, 140, the 140, 140 beats a minute thing. So there used to be a, a caller down there named Edna Mae Davis who lived in the Ozarks. And she was the main caller when Bob, this guy Bob Holt would play. And if, and if so I stood in for him a few times and did this 140 beats a minute routine. Well, it's very difficult to keep up because their dances were done for 10 or 15 minutes, you know. And, and so you're playing at that tempo the whole time. Uh, you learn to play with economy of motion, I'll say that, and you throw a few notes away along, along the way. But so if you weren't playing fast enough, she would come up to you, and the dancers first, you'd see them start to look at one another and scowl a bit because it was <laughs> slowing down, you know, which you tend to do over time. So she'd come stand next to you and tap her, stamp her foot and, and go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> until she brought you back up where you needed to be, and then then you could go on from there. And they're stepping through the square dance. Yeah, they're jig, the jig they're dancing, jig with dancing jingle taps yeah, on the whole, the whole time. What's this called? The kind of dance? It's, it's just a square it's dance, just a an square Ozark dance. square it's dance. Missouri. Yeah, yeah. yeah Ozark it's square a dance. Thing. Oh, wow. But the dancing yeah. was cool because they would dance as, you know, some places you go square dances. The square is very spread out, and people are doing these wide sweeping turns. They dance in a tight little square, almost no space between them. As like they do a a do si do, and they're just bare, almost touching shoulders when they go around each other, just to keep because you can't do it fast enough you if you to spread out too much. Get close. So, any questions about timing? I got a comment. So yes. You mentioned Bob Christensen. Yeah. I'll tell you, I found myself in a square with him and Mrs. Christensen one day back in 1975, and everybody was confused as heck and sweating like crazy. And there's this one gentleman, you know, with brown trousers and a western shirt and all, and white hair, and he seemed like he was barely moving, or his wife neither. Yeah. And they were just like going around the square with absolutely no trouble whatsoever, and anytime anyone would get confused, the old man, he would just go like this, he'd go, or... <laughs> Tell him which way to go. Yeah, it's just jerk your thumb and then everything would settle back down and it was him. Yeah. So we became friends after that. That's amazing. Him. But his timing on the dance floor was just every bit as good as his timing on the fiddle and also what you said about the squares being tight, they weren't moving as anywhere near as much as anyone else in the square. Sure. And they sort of kept it compact. Yeah. Anyway, just the two of them did that without That's great. saying a word. That's great. It's amazing. Yeah. Just, I, just reminded me. That's cool. I never actually got to see him dance. I oh, knew he, he loved good, dancing he was as a youth. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. It's the only time I ever saw him. Was that that was must have been when he was with the USDA there. In, in I Washington. guess so. Yeah. So it was 1975. Right. And it was at the West Virginia State Folk Festival. Wow. Oh, oh, at Glenville. Yeah, they came over to Glenville. Wow. Yeah, it was very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very if you cool can, guy. if you can look up this guy, Bob R. P. Christensen or Bob Christensen. Fascinating individual, yeah. And again, didn't consider himself a folklorist, and but he was, he, if, you are, if someone ever asked him, I, he'd give a talk once in a while, and somebody say, "So you're an expert or whatever," and he'd interrupt them, and say, "No, I'm a hobbyist." Yeah. So he always called himself a hobbyist. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll move on to. Oh, go ahead. One question. Yeah, go ahead. Tips on how not to speed up. Oh, okay. Uh, that's. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a really good question actually because that's uh, everyone tends to do that. I think one thing to do, I don't recommend playing with a metronome. Uh, I can't stay with a metronome myself. That's why I like this beat per minute thing because it's like the reverse. All of a sudden, it's, you it's, know, you start at one sixteen and now you're at one twenty. So I'll see that and I'll, you know, try to pull right, it back. Right. So so, so that device that. works for that. But I'd say find a recording that you that you like to play with and just stick to that. One thing is too, if you're not not sure on the tune, our tendency, especially when we're playing by ourselves, when we're playing a tune that we don't play maybe as well as others, the easy parts we play fast and the hard parts we tend to slow down. Everybody's experienced that, I think. So you want to try to stay, play, don't play the tune any faster than you can play the hardest Hard bit. Uh, but that, that is a, it's a perennial problem. I still sometimes speed up, you know, you have to be very, you have to be very aware, especially if you're playing for dancers. If you're just jamming, you know, it's not such a big deal, but if you're playing for you a know, dance. You know, I watch the dancers when I play, and I can see 
start if they struggle. What do you do, um, Charlie, to um, what do you do to maintain that speed and, and hold, hold it up and not completely wear yourself out and play in a way that's relaxing enough that it's fun for you to dance to and it still feels stylish and it feels easy? What are, what what technically do you do to play a fast square dance tune and say if you have to play it for ten or fifteen minutes? Right. Or I'll just ask you what <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to have the right tune for starters, because because I think some we we found too, and this is one a technique we use when we're playing for contras. I think some tunes have a cruising speed, you know what? And and so and so when I need a slow tune or slower tune, I know there's some tunes I can't play fast because they're just they're either too weird, the bowing wise, or there's something noty about them that I it would never be run off into the weeds. So that's one thing to play slow. Uh, when you're playing at a faster tempo and you just want to keep it even, I I tend tend to just might I might shorten up my bowing a little bit, just play a little with a little shorter stroke, use more saw stroking because I think you can manage the tempo a little but better. But you know, playing if you had to play stroke. fast for a long time, you might pick 14 Days of Georgia or some tune with because it doesn't have that many notes per beat. Okay, that's see, that's yeah. yeah. And did you say don't play with a metronome? I don't pl recommend playing because it's not natural, you know, no. to play. I don't think it's natural. You won't sound natural playing with, with a metronome. Because no one it does is show you how far off you are. <laughs> all the music teachers make you practice your skills with it just to prove to you that you are not as regular as you thought. But, but you say the best thing is play with a recording. Play with the recording or use one of these things that, you know, if you're, you have this app, you know, it'll tell you if you're speeding up or slowing down. But the one, you want it to feel natural, though. That's the most important thing. What's the name of that app again? I think it's called Live BPM. Okay. So when you play with that app, do you find that you just stay steady the whole time? Or is that yeah. Like that? No, but it, but it only, I only vary a few beats per minute, you know, okay. in the course of a dance, you know. Because I've been playing so long, I can play pretty con consistently. But it's it's a useful feedback tool. It is. Though, we don't you know. vary that much, but once in a while I'll look at. It. Yeah, you see yourself speeding up, you know, and then you and you realize, oh, that's getting a little too fast. So. Anything else about timing or tone? Okay. Well, we'll move on to the most nebulous of all categories: execution. Live BPM, I think it's called. Live BPM. And I'm and I'm and I. Don't have to do a disclaimer. I wish I was getting a dollar for every one that sold. Just like an amazing slowdowner. I wish I had a dollar for every amazing slowdowner that's been sold. Too, but no such luck. So uh, so now we'll come to execution. And so uh, uh, that's, a, like I say, a, a broad category. But uh, when we were doing our whole, that was the big, when we did our score sheet, timing was 25. Tone was 25 and execution was 50, the most, yeah. you know, non-defined category. But that allows the judge to say, "Oh, that was a good performance." And it's the execution is when you're putting the whole thing together, you know. And so under execution, I include things like intonation. You know, are you playing in tune? Uh, and uh, then also rhythm uh, and the especially rhythmic accent. You know, fiddle music is like. A dialect, uh, you know, it's all say say here in the. If I talk about American style fiddle music, you know, the tunes we're kind of talking about this conglomerate of tunes that's not Irish Celtic or Scottish Celtic, and not so much Canadian, but just the the core of American fiddle music. You know, the the Ragtime Annie, the Soldier's Joy, the, the Liberty, the Mississippi Sawyer, those kind of tunes. You know, that's the like core of American fiddling. Well. Just like that's say that's American style English. Well, people in Georgia don't talk like people in Boston do. They they just have a different rhythmic accent. And people in Appalachia don't talk like people in Colorado. You know. And in St. Louis, people wash their hands in zincs. They wash they their wash. hands in zincs. You know. So <laughs> so so that's what I'm getting at by rhythmic accent. And and one of the most fun things about playing fiddle is to find your niche. You know. Because there's now you don't have to live in a region to take up a regional dialect of fiddling, but so I've got my own way of playing, and so that's informed by where I grew up and the people I learned from, and then a big portion of it is idiosyncratic, just to you. You know, you're you're playing your own style as well, just because of who you are and how you're constructed. But so you, you, that's something you want to try to find is what's what's my what's my sound. You know, that's what you want to try try to develop. Uh, 
But let's talk a little bit about uh, intonation then. So, so uh, this is a useful tool here. These little, have you, anybody see these little tuners here? I have, I've been using this. I, I wish I was making money on these, but I can't. I have to keep to advertising all these things. But so uh, this is a, what, who makes this thing? Diodario makes these little tiny tuner. The reason I like it is uh, uh, it picks up the note very quickly. And I find, I've been in contests actually where I tune off to the side and then I get up on stage and I realize it's on and it's going, oh, that note was out, you know, it's like telling you. <laughs> it does. <laughs> but it picks up really fast. But actually, especially for a waltz, like it'll pick up every note on a slow tune and tell you whether it's in tune or not. Hmm. Now, again, that's a little too strict because fiddle playing, fiddle music and music in general isn't dead on all the time, but it'll give you some ideas. So that's one way to practice your intonation. But I always, the best way though is to, uh, Compare, listen, and compare to uh, the uh, the open strings. Like if I'm playing in D, you know, and I want to play this F sharp with D, with the open A. Chord there, and this. So you have to go slow. And you have to listen very critically to yourself. Play one interval at a time with an open string and know what those relationships are and then you can start to kind of move your fingers around and tune yourself up that's one way to improve your intonation another way is though to know where your fingers go ahead of time and that's by you know it's 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 called uh, you know working already plowed ground in other words playing scales and arpeggios uh, i'll put some of my cards up here later and if you want to send me an email you can look on my website and find my email address too but I've got a little thing I made up it's a PDF about eight pages and it's pictures of the fingerboard and it shows for every chord it shows you where all the notes are so you can play the arpeggios and you can play all the two note combinations and then one page is major the next page is the dominant sevenths the next page is the minor sevenths and you can find all these note combinations but the fiddle music is loaded with arpeggios. Does everyone know what an arpeggio is? It's uh, when you take, it's a broken chord. When you take a chord and you play the notes one at a time like a scale. So play a C chord. C. Now play a C arpeggio. Or, I just, I did that. I, just didn't I did it my way. Usually people <laughs> don't play arpeggio sets. I do them slow. So like, let's, let's just play G. So it's always the th first, third, and fifth scale note, okay? So in G, we're gonna play all the G's, B's, and D's from here to here, okay? So we're just gonna play them like a scale. I'm gonna, two beats, you know, ba, da, or one beat, we'll just do one beat. So, so it's gonna sound like this, just listen. those is you know your fingers will already know where to go when you I, I don't practice them to the point of nausea you know uh, but I just play them and I and a lot of times when I'm getting ready to play a tune I'll just kind of you know set my fingers by or play a little chord you know to set my fingers you hear guys do it when they're getting ready people do it when they're getting ready to play in a fiddle contest you know they got I'm a G yeah that's right so so there are whole tunes you know that are just arpeggios like play it play a G here you know, that's a little tune called the Poppy Leaf Hornpipe. It's in Cole's 1000 Fiddle Tunes. But it's all... Those are all arpeggio notes. So if you practice the arpeggios, it will improve your execution of any tune in any key. You'll, it'll only make things better. Uh, you know, it's playing the fiddle sometimes is like the old elephant joke. Remember the elephant joke era? You know, they used to say, uh, 
how do you make a statue of an elephant? You take a block of marble and carve away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. <laughs> well, you know, part of playing a tune and learning a tune is first knowing where not to put your fingers. Sometimes when I'm, I'm teaching a tune, I'll say, you know, if you're using your second finger, it's wrong, you know. So, so it, playing the arpeggios helps you avoid that, that difficulty. I think we should let them play a tune. I've talked so much. Yes, God. you have, dear. Oh, man, it's just endless. But I do have a few more things to say, but that'll be after we play some more tunes. What should we play in G? What should we play in G? Does people play Danced All Night with a Bottle in My Hand? Do you know that? Okay. All right. Is that... Is that what, got a winner. Okay, I got enough heads shaking. Okay, let's try a little yeah. bit of that here. Last thing I want to say is uh, um, how to uh, one part of execution, like if you're playing a contest or playing for fun and make it more interesting, is to put in variations. And I'm not talking about the kind of you know over the top kind of jazzy variations where you lose sight of the tune. But I'll use that's a good example. I've got my own. I've been playing some of these tunes so long. I got my own kind of stylized way of playing them, you know. And so that one I've got a lot of junk worked in. So let me just play through it a couple, three times just to put in some, you know, things that aren't the melody, but they're not so far off the melody that you still can't tell what tune is going on. So here we go. Mixing it up a little bit, putting a little passage in there. It just makes it more fun to play, more interesting to listen to. But you work out those things ahead of time. Oh, yeah. They, they well, just they, don't come. Well, there were some <laughs> things that were coming. I've, I've got a bag of tricks, you know. You throw it <laughs> under the tent, so. so anybody else uh, got any more questions or comments or anything? Requests. I think, oh, I think I'm supposed to go to 1215. Actually, let's just play some tunes. What do you say? You want to just play a few tunes? Okay, so what, what would you like to try? We like to play a lot of tunes in 6-8 time. Does anybody play any tunes in 6-8 time? Oh, they're, they're fun to play. Let's see. Should we try to play? 
just let them play. All right, let's yes, play. You guys suggest some tunes you want to play. Let's, let's go ahead. What do you say? What do you mean? That's what <laughs> what would you guys like to try? Uh, let's play some hoedowns. What would you like to play? Anybody got any ideas? Uh, how about Rachel? Do you know that? Or Texas Quick Step, some people call it. Let's play a little bit of that. And that's easy to follow on. And again, uh, you know, going back to the this is the, the arpeggio tune to end all arpeggio tunes. It's, let's try a little bit of Rachel. In D, right? I lost this tuner a while back, and I realized you can actually tune the fiddle with your ear. Oh, Amazing. Yeah. Who'd have thought it, you know? <laughs> All right, here we go. Not too fast. I'm telling myself that, not you. Okay, that. good. Did you notice we speed it up a little bit? We did. Again, because that's like there's the cruising speed of that tune, right, and that is, it's hard yeah. to hold it back, you know? I mean, I'll look at the dance caller's cards, and I'll see what tempo that should be, but then i got to think of which tune we play at that speed. Yeah. Right. I just can't name any tune, <laughs> because they it. go at the speed you play. That they go at, basically. right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, he said all it does is stir up dust, but I see everybody has. No. That's what he told me, just stirs up dust, and I feel like this is a classical and player. And I noticed when you sometimes <laughs> you're on your feet, you'll use your other because you're off and off. I was watching you. This one. Get, on look, this one gets tired, so I switch to the other one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you tapping your foot is That's important, right. you know. It is. I think yeah. so too. Yeah. And especially I'm a, taking lessons from them. Okay. <laughs> well, especially on like this wooden floor up here, yeah. if you have a good soft cowboy boot with a big heel on it, bam, 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 yeah, bam you Aaron really Marshall make a lot of, you, you can make a lot of noise with that. Yeah, but no, tap okay. your foot for sure. I, yeah. In fact, I encourage people to tap their feet because for one thing, oh. you know, you're sitting, to tap your foot, you got to kind of sit square on the chair. You know, you can't be, you know, laying back like this, you know, or something. And then so your feet are square on the floor and you're poised, ready to play, you know, so if you tap your foot it's all the better oh, tap your foot you can yeah. tap your heel tap your toe whatever yeah, yeah. yeah i know yeah like if you're in band or when i was in band in high school you know that's you can only tap your toe inside, inside your shoe, your shoe. <laughs> people would be off that's well, why right. band well, yeah. do that because some be people can't tap off. their feet in time right, right. <laughs> yeah. what's another one we can do guys oh, you, can you think of a tune oh, I had flowers at edinburgh do you play that Flowers of Edinburgh. We can play it. Does anybody, uh, any of you guys, play that tune? Sure, I've seen some heads bob. Okay, let's try that. Yeah. This is the old, the old Scottish tune. Yep. Here, let's see. <laughs> 
years ago we stayed with this friend of ours he lives right on the coast of New Brunswick in a little inlet just to south of where the Gas Bay Peninsula and there's a lot of great fiddlers in New Brunswick in fact all the good fiddlers that were on records Canadian fiddle records in the 50s and 60s those most of those guys were from New Brunswick Ned Landry Don Messer was from that region uh, so anyway there's this guy we met named Clayton Callahan he was in his 80s then and he's since passed away but he was a radio fiddler from the early days in the 40s. He used to play on the radio a lot. And for every tune he played, he had a tag worked out, almost like a unique tag on almost every tune. And the tag would start four bars before the tune was over, like I just did then, you know? So it had the, and it was like the greatest way to telegraph to everyone that you're getting ready to quit, too. So, so I've been messing around with playing these weird tags that are part of the tune. But it's just kind of fun. All right, what's another one we can do there? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, let's play. That's a six-eight time tune. Little burnt potato. If you know any jig at all, you might know little burnt. Potato. Right. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a big one. That's one of our faves. Yeah, yeah. Let's play a little bit of that. Sure. Yeah. We'll see what happens here. So six-eight time. If you haven't played in six-eight time and you're an old-time musician, there's nothing wrong with playing in no, six-eight time. It's not a crime. It's not a crime. You can do it. And uh, I've been I've been everywhere I've been going lately, and I'll do it this weekend too. I'm on a crusade to preserve these Midwestern quadrilles, they call them. They're six eight time tunes. They're not Irish, they're not Scottish, they're uniquely American tunes. A lot of them came out of collections that were printed in the Victorian era in the late 19th century. And they're just cool little ditties and they're real easy to learn. So I'll teach one of those this weekend. But let's let's play the little burnt potato. That's a tune uh, that was composed like a composed piece of music in D. So let's see if we can play a little bit of it here. So if you don't know uh, what a jig or 6-8 time tune is, if you think Flanagan, 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 that's the time. It'll work with the jig. It'll work with the jig. Do you so. have any tips for bowing six tunes in 6-8 time? Because as a, somebody who plays mostly 4-4 four, four time, right. when I try 6-8, like, my bowing is always in the wrong place. What I'd do, I'd start out sawing everything. Uh, you know, just saw everything at first, and then, and then you'll find there's you'll need to turn the bow around and needle slur here and there. But yeah, you got to keep that. Jig, they call the jiggy bowing. G -g -g -d 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 you got to keep that kind of going. So uh, that's uh, that's not very instructive necessarily. But it mostly it is saw stroke. But it is mostly saw stroke. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's try it. A little burnt potato.
tunes are a lot of fun to play. That's why we like them, because they're just uplifting and happy, you know? Unlike Irish jigs, you know, there's no, those right. E minor, let's play a brace of maudlin E minor Irish jigs, you know, <laughs> everyone would be crying afterwards. But, but these are nice and happy, so we, that's why we like them. Well, we should, shall we play the Westphalia Waltz and call it a sure. call it time? Does everybody sure. know the Westphalia Waltz and G? Okay, let's try a little bit of that. I wanted to say one more thing. Look at my website, it's just charliewalden.com. I've got, there's a thing that says free fiddle tune notation. I've got like 300 and some tunes up there already. PDFs you can download. I'm adding more all the time, so, and there, there's no paywall or anything. Just have Adam, you know, grab as many as you want. And same with my, uh, uh, you know, downloadable recordings on that Bandcamp site. Just, you know, they're, they're all priced at zero, so just help yourself here. Okay, West Valley Walls, right? One, two, three, one, two. everybody for coming. Thank Appreciate you. it. You were very patient. <laughs> you listen to a lot of talking. <laughs> oh yeah, sounds great. That's that's a good one.